Hello everyone, and welcome to the show. My name is Chris Salamo, and I am an amateur investor. This podcast is my open source journal of everything I learn about investing and wealth management. I'm here to explore the key concepts, market dynamics, and investing strategies that will assist you on the path towards financial independence and financial literacy. My mission is to build us from amateurs to experts. All suggestions are my own, and I recommend that you should do your own research before taking any investment advice. See you in this week's episode. I hope you enjoy. All right. Welcome back to another episode of the Amateur Investors. This is episode 79. I'm here with Ivan Makedonsky. I I know I butchered that completely, (laughs) Uh, but I'm happy to be here for another episode talking all things Bitcoin. Ivan, how's it going? Nice, nice going. Uh, Happy to see you on Monday, start of the week. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I'm uh, excited for this conversation. So Ivan, I I just love to ask Bitcoiners, what, when did you get into Bitcoin and what led you into it and what kept you here basically? Okay. Uh, Well, I would say that the first time that I've heard about Bitcoin was probably around 2013, but it was like old, like passing by, oh, it's up or whatever. Some people made a lot of money there but it was just a passing thought and nothing too much but uh, around end of 2019 uh, my girlfriend uh, told me okay let's get into crypto and started bugging me about ethereum because she bought one ethereum for 50 pounds and then it just showed up up to uh, i don't know like uh, four thousand dollars during the year and every day or week somebody was bombarding me from everywhere get into crypto get into crypto and i said i worked for forex companies a few of them and it was a complete scam like uh that was the job of the salesperson to get the person to put money in the company and in order to get your money back it was almost impossible uh and uh just going into that industry and I just left there. Absolutely. I didn't feel, uh, feel right to me uh, because of the moral issue. And I thought that Bitcoin and crypto was the same thing. And especially when a lot of, I would say, low IQ people tell you, oh, get into it. Then it was like kind of confirming. And I was thinking, oh, this is going to crash, of course. And there's coming people. And also I knew that one of the companies uh, that was in the Bulgarian market was selling uh, all kinds of crypto to, again, to use their scamming opportunity with that. So uh, at the end of 2020, when everybody was talking about it, uh, a close friend called me and told me, I want to return your money back. And he owed me money for, I don't know how many. And I was like, uh, I didn't expect that at all. And then I said, okay, let me learn because this person (laughs) already made money. So let me see what's that about. And uh, the Christmas holiday, it was like 10, 12 days of uh, Christmas break. I locked myself in a room and for... 10, 12 hours straight, I was listening to podcasts to figure this out. And right then and there, I understood, okay, there is Bitcoin and there is everything else. <laughs> so uh, I listened to Breedlove, I listened to Jeff Booth, uh, Michael Saylor, all, all those kinds of things. And I very quickly figured out uh, what is true. I still uh, went into crypto just to confirm uh, my thoughts. Uh, as a personal experience but uh, that was kind of my journey because everybody was bothering me but when they touched an emotional button uh, in me then I decided okay let's learn it let's not be idiots and from then on I just started accumulating a little by little and expanding my knowledge 
That's awesome. Great story and a lot of great podcasts. I listened to a lot of the same ones when I first started my journey. I was also the class of 2020 when I truly got in. I remember my dad actually telling me about um, Laszlo when he bought the pizzas. He's like, yeah, this guy bought two pizzas with 10,000 Bitcoin, like this magic internet money. And I remember he even asked me, he's like, should I put a thousand bucks into it? And I was like, nah, it'll never catch on. And then now here I am working for Bitcoin magazine and such. Knowing my dad, even if I was like, absolutely, you should definitely buy it. He's very more risk adverse. So he probably wouldn't have done it anyway. So I don't have any regrets, not to throw him under the bus, but like if I were to say it, he'd look into trying to buy it and he'd be like, ah, this is too much of a headache. So he wouldn't do it. Uh, I guess my, yeah. my next question then is where you said you worked for Forex companies. So were they, yeah. were they advising you like, don't touch this crypto thing, don't touch this Bitcoin thing, or were they like neutral? Did they not have an opinion? Just curious back in the early days, like you said, 2013, 2014, what were their thoughts on uh, in general? Yeah. Uh, the, uh, when I joined, uh, by the way, I switched three companies in a span of uh, two months. And I switched three companies and just because I found out in the first one that it's a scam and I was searching for an ethical one that it was a legitimate product. And uh, because there wasn't, uh, the first moment when I make a sale, then you find out how they treat their client. Because they, even inside the company, the new comers, they don't tell them what uh, exactly it is. You have to figure it out on your own, whether it's a scam or because they are telling you, oh, sell this binary option, sell this forex, sell this, this and that. But when you actually close the deal and you see what they do with the money of the person, then you actually understand what's really behind uh, the company morals, values and everything else. And at that time, a lot of companies entered uh, the market in Bulgaria from outside and the young people were attracted because they were giving bigger salaries than everywhere else. So when you start uh, selling and in that span uh, of two months, I just find out, okay, they're all scammers and uh, they make you sign an NDA, uh, what you're exactly doing and stuff like that. And I just got out. That was around 2017, 16, 17. I'm not exactly certain, but around that period. And uh, yeah, they they don't tell you nothing. They don't tell you this is uh, good or bad. They just want you to scam a person. And that is it. Yeah, that's horrible. It's, you know, you hate to see business models like that. And then I'm sure even as they close down or shut down, they spin up under a new name, a new LLC, a new business yeah. incorporation. So the, these uh, scammers run in the similar circles with just different names. And, you know, they just try and rebrand themselves or change their identity or, you know, ch- like quite literally some of them do change their name to try and like skirt some of the uh, allegations that go against them, which is even crazier. Um, yeah. Well, so that's considered a very high time preference. And I know in Bitcoin, we talk about high time preference, which means is like right now, you know, instantaneously, instant gratification. And then many Bitcoiners talk about low time preference. So I know uh, we were talking a little about about Bitcoin inheritance. I don't know if you had a chance to listen to the Bitcoin Review podcast. It's run by NVK, but on episode 17, he talks with a bunch of lawyers and legal counsel about inheritance planning and like planning your future for your kids or your spouse or just your heirs in general, giving your Bitcoin and passing it down from yourself to someone else. So here in the States, I know you're in Bulgaria or uh, at least in, yep. in Europe somewhere. Um, there is in the United States, there's a thing called probate, which is basically the process of when you die is you have to go through your, your assets become legal record, unless you either yep. have a trust or a will, then the probate process becomes different. So basically, if you die and you have nothing, the state basically takes over your assets and then divvies them up a bunch of your heirs. Obviously, the lawyers get paid a lot. Obviously, the state gets paid a lot. Uh, There's another way of a will, which is slightly better, but still not the best, where obviously you outline who gets what, your car, your house, your, you know, your cat, whatever, your Bitcoin, stocks, equities, all of that. But still, the the state has an oversight of it, and normally they bring in a lawyer to do so. A trust, and I know it's common 
know, with like trust fund babies, these kids with, you know, $25 million plus trust endowments, there's ways of when you die, there's living trust and irrevocable trust. I don't need to get in the nuance of that because I'm not a lawyer and this is not financial advice, but there's ways that you can set up a trust that, you know, your kid gets an allotment or a salary every year, or, you know, maybe it goes in there and when you die, and let's just say you died and your kid's 18, they don't get the money till they're 58 and a half, or you can set it up however you want, but there's ways that it blocks the government from coming in and piercing it and taking your money. It also prevents your family or your, your kids or your spouse from going in there and doing things that you may not want the money to be used for. Um, so I know that's a long wet winded answer, but I guess I'm curious, what are your thoughts on inheritance and passing down your Bitcoin? And what are some of the ways that it can be done in Bulgaria or where you're based out of? Uh, yeah, uh, I would say this is a topic that I uh, really thought about uh, even before getting into Bitcoin because of my personal experience, let's say, because in 2014, I would say that uh, at that time, uh, 2013, end of that year, uh, my mother was trying to divorce my father. And at that point, because she was the main earner in the family and he was like uh, what I call a central bank these days, just give me without any effort. <laughs> and uh, uh, at that point, when he realized that, okay, this is really happening, he literally kidnapped and killed her. And at uh, that point, uh, me and my sister, which is younger than me, were left to deal with all the mess that is about uh, inheritance and not only inheritance, but all the emotional and all kinds of problems that occur there. And even before becoming a Bitcoiner, I realized what are the laws about uh, the inheritance piece. You even, uh, if you have a will in Bulgaria, it's not really your will <laughs> that you can't execute exactly what you want because she wanted to undo the uh, assets that she accumulated in her lifetime a certain way and the laws don't allow that to actually happen. And not only from the lawyer's fees and even banks blocking you and all sorts of stuff, but... Uh, uh, you just realize that all the stuff that you own, they're not actually your, yours when you die. And you don't really know what's going to happen. And because of that experience, I even thought about, okay, uh, so when you get married in Bulgaria, uh, everything that you buy in a marriage is half-owned. So let's say that the wife buys a house, even if she pays all of it because she's married, half of the house is owned by the other person and vice versa. So everything that she ever bought <laughs> was divided and uh, the, her killer owned half of it. And not only that, but even the, the other half, you can't uh, just execute the will Let's say you want to uh, give it 100% to somebody, whoever that is. No, you can't. There's a, uh, how they call it, a, a reserved piece for everybody that is uh, in uh, the heirs. And because in the Bulgarian court system, he did not, uh, even though he was in jail, he was uh, not convicted finally for seven years. So everything that she owned, we couldn't even use for seven years because he was a full citizen, but under arrest. And going through that process, uh, it was just uh, not good. But really realizing that once you sign the document that you are married, that means that at that point, the church and the state are in your relationship with the person that you love and even then again before i was a bitcoiner i realized that the two biggest monopolies ever are in all the marriages uh, from now on and just that thought alone uh, thought okay i don't want the state to be in my uh, relationship at all and in uh, fast forward to seven years after uh, and getting into Bitcoin, now I realize that uh, there are solutions with multi-sig, with companies and things like that. But 
I'm not a really big fan. They're good, but if you involved any other entity, that means that it's going to trigger uh, a potential review from the state or from anywhere else. And again, you get into this gray area of the laws. Uh, what exactly is your will? <laughs> And what does the state allow you to be your will? So really not a good situation. And I'm really a fan of solutions where nobody knows uh, what is your will. And Bitcoin is the first ever thing that no matter how, how much is the price of it, you can uh, execute your will with Bitcoin 100% how you want it to be. So if you want to give it to everybody equally, you just die with your Bitcoin, as Sailor says. If you want to give it to one person, you give it to one person. If you go want to give it to five people, you give it to five people. And you can manage to do that. So this is one of the things that, because of my experience, I'm very passionate about. And uh, I, you bet that I already set up those policies, uh, what would happen with my Bitcoin. Yeah, Ivan, I actually, I just want to start off and I, I want to apologize for what happened to your mom and everything that happened with your dad. So I, I'm so sorry. I, I did actually did not know that. So um, yeah, I, I hope everything gets better uh, with time, obviously. Um, I think you made a great point though, about the separation of church and state. It's very funny that like, you know, at least in the U S they write like separation of church and state, blah, 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 blah. But at the point of marriage or most people's marriages, it's the union of you, your spouse, and then the church and state. So it's kind of like a four-way relationship that it's you, your significant yeah. other, and then the church and state. And that's very, very funny that you say in terms of inheritance, it's basically like, well, if you die and you want to give it to your kids, well, if your spouse is still alive, they get half. And then and obviously the state comes in and they want an inheritance, you know, uh, package or that they, they want taxes based on the death of what you've done, even if they have no hand in it. Or, you know, I know they claim that they have part of it based on protecting you and the roads and keeping the laws. Uh, but that's the price of that's only ever gone up historically over time. Yeah, it varies. It goes down yeah. from some years, but it, you know, it's kind of like a up and to the right and basically in terms of the amount of taxes they collect. And that's excluding the amount of money that they print, uh, you know, just the amount of money that they send globally abroad. So uh, very, very good points. So you actually yeah. lead to my next point that I was getting to more of if you don't want to involve the state. So I want to caveat and say, once again, this is not legal advice. This is not tax advice. This is not financial advice. But exactly to your point, if you buy Bitcoin in a non-KYC manner, which means not know your uh, no know your customer like laws or using a regulated exchange, if you buy Bitcoin peer to peer or from someone that they don't know who you, you bought it from, and you basically put this in either a multi-sig or in, a, in you know, you basically have a private address that controls the keys to this. You could pass it to your heirs without the state knowing. I know there's caveats. And in listening to episode 17 with NVK, the Bitcoin review, I highly recommend everyone listen to it. And this is a bunch of legal experts. They say, obviously, at that point, technically, when you die and you give it to your heirs, technically, uh, they could be in run from the state. Now, it's up to them. You know, if the state doesn't know that you have it and you give it to them then you know how can they be on the run from the state if they never knew that they bought it in the first place so it's kind of one of yeah. those catch uh, 22s and i agree there's many great co companies that are good for collaborative custody so that may guarantee that your bitcoin gets from you to your kids or to your spouse if they're not as tech savvy or if they don't understand bitcoin using the helping hand of another company allows you to do this but exactly to your point if you have it in your will you want to pass down Obviously, that company has to act in the fiduciary duty of themselves, as well as they don't want to go to jail. So they have to let the government know, hey, this person died. We have a, ta uh, a death certificate saying this person passed away and they're passing it to their spouse or to their kids or to wherever. So obviously, the government's going to swoop in, take their tax cut and you know step up whatever the cost of the Bitcoin is. So your kids will get the Bitcoin, but obviously less some of the fees. Um, so I, I guess my caveat to you is, I guess in your hype, in your hypothetical world or hypothetical scenario, what is the best way to pass your Bitcoin to your spouse, to your kids, to your heirs, to whoever, or I, I, without doxing your setup and being like, Chris, my Bitcoin's buried in a backyard in a private tree with, you know, with yeah. a private key and a multi-sig that does this. But in theory, what would be the best way for you to give your Bitcoin to your heirs or to your spouse? Uh Right now, I'm kind of searching uh, for solutions that could uh, trigger some point uh, uh, in the future. Let's say you uh, set up uh, your wallet to transfer it to another wallet. But uh, uh, there, 
There is one solution about that, but you kind of have to manage along the years that uh, you have to stop the transaction if uh, you're still alive. There isn't a solution where you could say, uh, theoretically, I was thinking, let's say you have a wallet in the future that you could trigger if this wallet is inactive, let's say for the next three, four, five years, whatever you set up, then transfer it to whatever address to your ARs and or even uh, uh, in percentages, let's say uh, I want to give 20% to charity, 40% uh, to one of the kids, 40% to the other kids or whatever kind of percentages. But uh, the trigger point to be some kind of a timer and not uh, the solution that I saw that uh, you actually make the transaction in the future blocks but you have to cancel that in the future. So that's not ideal, but it is kind of a solution. And the other thing where it's possible even now is that uh, you just set up uh, the keys for the wallet. Uh, and if uh, you have one air, you just tell them, okay, I'll give you uh, half of the keys. Uh, half of the words, let's say if it's 12 words, you give them six of the words. And in your will, you just say, I leave you with this poem or whatever it is. And it's uh, the other six words and they know what that thing is and they have direct access to the account. And if it's non-KYC, not even a transfer occurs and they just own the Bitcoin that you had. And if you want to give it to multiple heirs, you just set up the uh, a few wallets and you give them the keys after they die. And because it's just half of the keys and while you're alive, uh, they can't access it. But that's kind of a solution theoretically that uh, could happen even today. But I would much rather prefer in the future something that it triggers from an inactive wallet or something like that. I have not found that thing yet. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I think that's some great points. Uh, I need to ask, uh, Matt O'Dell had this great website. I think it's called ghost.link. It's basically a way that it works is it uses encrypted messaging. Uh, there is a little bit of trust on this platform, but let's just say you pay, and it's relatively cheap. I think it's $50 for a year, 25 bucks for six months, and then it's like $7 for three months or a month. Basically, the way that it works is you type in a message, and it doesn't have to be like your private keys. I actually advocate you do not do that. But it could be a message yeah. like, hey, the private keys are hidden in the backyard behind a tree, you know, underneath this X spot that I made out of sticks. And it gives you an encrypted message. So you pay for a year and let's just say I don't die in a year. I pay an extra 50 bucks and it doesn't send the message out. God forbid I forget or, you know, I do die. The message sends to you. You have to give a an email address and a backup email address. So like, let's just say you give your spouse's email address or your son or daughter's email address. In the event that you die and you don't pay the fee, the $50 a year, a message goes out to them and it says, hey, there's this encrypted message. You need to use the encrypted key so that the platform itself can't see, but you use the encrypted code to unlock the message uh, or th there's basically a password that they have to use to get into this encrypted message. And then it gives either the instructions to get to your Bitcoin. I guess in theory, you could put the seed words in there, but then you're kind of revealing your private key to the internet. And there's compromises if God forbid their server gets hacked and somehow someone's able to break the encryption, then they were able to see what those private keys are. And I wouldn't advocate for that, but mainly it's the instructions normally of like, Hey, I have a two of three multi-sig, you know, one key is here. One key is here. One key is here. You need to get two of these three in order to sign a message to release this Bitcoin to your custody. That's normally what you would leave this message for. And every year, if you're paying the fee, it doesn't send the message. God forbid you die or forget to pay. It sends the message to them of how to get your Bitcoin. Um, uh -huh. So that's one way to do it. There's another one called watch uh, Anchor Watch Risk and Insurance. It's by Rob Hamilton and it's using Miniscript. So it's very similar to what you were talking about, Ivan, of doing either a Miniscript credential that let's just say it starts as a two of three multi-sig, but then after 30 years, God forbid I die after 30 years, instead of being two of three, it becomes a one of two so or a, a one of three, meaning that instead of requiring two of three keys, you only, if one person has a key, they can move the Bitcoin. So if you give one to your kids, to your wife and all this, you know, God forbid you die. And, you know, in that time frame 
they're like, well, we can't use the Bitcoin. He's been dead for 10 years. We need 20 more years in order for to be able to use this. You know, you, they can finally get access as long as they have one key. And this is using programmatically Bitcoin's programmability and the um, basically you're building in a smart contract. I know people say in the crypto world, oh, Bitcoin, you can't do smart contracts. Yeah, you can. You just can't print your own money, which is why the crypto people hate Bitcoin. Um, yeah. So yeah, th th those are just kind of two facets. And then kind of like what you said, the I, I don't want to say the tried and true method, but the method that seems to be the best is basically you give them a private key or a wallet with some Bitcoin and you'd be like, this is for you. And then, you know, when you pass on, maybe you have a bigger multi-sig that uh, they can try and get to, but you kind of have to give the instructions for how to go about doing that. And and speaking with the the legal panel episode uh, seventeen from NVK Bitcoin Review, um, a lot of them say what you do is you put it in a safe. The instructions for how do you get it, and then obviously your heirs know where the keys to the safe are. But there's ways to do it that the uh, no single point of failure. It's not like your accountant and your lawyer have a key and you have a key, and if your lawyer and your accountant collude together, they could take your Bitcoin. It's more like you have a will drafted up or a trust saying like there's Bitcoin, you guys don't know how to get to it, but it's there, and then basically alluding to a map of how to get it. I know that was a long-winded response, but I guess uh, any thoughts on anything that I said there? So uh, it's it's not ghost.link, but it's something like that where you can send a message encrypted to your family. Anchor Watch Risk and Insurance by Rob Hamilton. It's a company to insure your Bitcoin and ways to do it with Miniscript, and, and then just basically the try and true method of just basically giving them a private key. Anything you want to comment there? Yeah. Uh, as I mentioned previously, I'm much more a fan of uh, being responsible yourself and setting it up yourself because believe me, through the experiences that I had, like you have no idea who would stop you. Even if it's not the state, just because there's some provision in the law and somebody who has negative thoughts about you or they just want your Bitcoin for the heck of it, they will stop you. And even if they can't have it, they will stop you to have it. Exactly what I've experienced. And if you involve another party and another party is the state or is a company or is an accountant, lawyer or anything, you're just exposing the knowledge about this. And just a thought while you are talking that it would be a very interesting world, let's say in 50, 60 years once we transition to Bitcoin standard, like the new gold diggers. <laughs> like uh, that would be a very interesting story. Now they're going uh, under sea about chips and stuff like that. Maybe they uh, got it out. But uh, uh, I never actually thought about that. Uh, what kind of stories would occur then? <laughs> Yeah, but well, definitely. When somebody, let's say Michael Saylor, goes and uh, like uh, a lot of people will go after <laughs> what he has. Yeah, yeah, that, that's a great point, and it's even funny, you know, gold digging. Well, there's that one guy in the UK that had like at, in its peak, or or maybe even when Bitcoin was like 20k, so right around now, I think he had. 290 million dollars worth of bitcoin he had it on an old laptop in like either 2011 or 2012 he was mining bitcoin on a laptop him and his girlfriend were together at the time they ended up breaking up they ended up moving apart and he ended up throwing the laptop in this dump and he has this like he's been trying to advocate for the state to go dig and he kind of knows where you know they uh, actually this is kind of cool with, with um most like waste management or dumps, they actually track generally by year or or kind of by date where the trash is. He's like, well, I know that we moved out at this date and I threw it out in like February or March of this date. So I could assume that it's in this trunk of trash that, yeah, there's a lot of it. But if I dig through it, maybe I can get in there. Uh, you know, I think and he's been pitching and obviously the UK government says it's too much of a risk. You know, he could get hurt. He could sue. He's like, I'm willing to sign over all my rights. Of, if I get hurt, you know, I won't sue. I like I'm taking like I'm signing away my legal right to sue, uh, but they still said no. So then now he's trying to get drones to fly in to grab it. It's this whole yeah. convoluted thing. Uh, but I can only imagine getting two hundred ninety million dollars. I think the worst case scenario is Today. they eventually. Yeah, it's but, uh, 290 today. Believe me, in three years, it will yeah, be. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe even, even more. Exactly. Um, I, I can only imagine. I think, worst case scenario, is he finally gets in there. He finally finds the computer with a stroke of luck, only to find out the hard drive's been punctured or like something like he can't boot the machine or it's rusted out. Uh, I think that would be worst case scenario after going through all the effort. I know he's even said like he'll give half of it or, you know, I think it was like 30% of it, 20% of it, whatever. And they still refused, which is really, really funny. Um, 
Yeah, I think you make some great points, though. Like when you whenever you add another party into your setup uh, outside of your family or outside of who you want to give it to, I like your idea of like giving it distributing it equally to everyone in the world by when you die and your Bitcoin's gone forever. I know I have friends that say that they want this. They don't have kids yet. So maybe that'll change when they have kids. But to your point, you never know if this company is going to be around in 50, 60 years. God willing, you and I live that long. You never know what rules and regulations are going to be there. It seems that they always keep getting more and more strict, not just in terms of Bitcoin, just in terms of everything in general. They just want more and more and more. They don't want less. They're never like, hey, we're giving you a break here. Or they do give you a break, but then they get you somewhere else. Um, so to your point, the less people that know that you have Bitcoin, probably the better. Probably doesn't help that I'm a public figure and do this for a living. But um, yeah, no, it, it, it's very, very interesting for sure. Um, yeah, and uh, one note that... Uh, at some point, everybody will have Bitcoin. That's unavoidable. But uh, the whole uh, good thing is that nobody knows how much. Uh, so, like you could say, oh, I, uh, it was uh, two Satoshis, the cheap bastard, <laughs> and you could lie to the state or whatever you choose to do. Not a legal advice. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but uh, one thing uh, also is that uh, I forgot my thought actually. Uh, uh, I, I mean, yeah, the, the, the one, the, the, no worries. The one way the state could know how much Bitcoin you have is obviously by using a regulated KYC exchange. So obviously, normally the amount of Bitcoin you have lives on that exchange forever. Uh, it has been seen, you know, in very re like it, it happens today where like Coinbase, I know, for example, like leaks your transactions to the IRS and to the government of how much Bitcoin you bought, what, where you're transacting it, where you're sending it, all this. So uh, they do keep track of it. Um, so where you buy non-KYC, no one knows you have it, or at least it's on the blockchain, but it's very hard to differentiate you yeah. um, of who this is moving the Bitcoin if you do it privately, if you buy from a miner, if you buy it uh, non-KYC. One, uh, yeah, I uh, remember the point is that uh, not only that Bitcoin could be 100% of your will, what you want to happen, but when you pass uh, things to your heirs, uh, I would say uh, what Sailor says about uh, property, the defects of uh, property uh, is really important because even if you give a thriving business to your heirs, they don't know how to manage it. They uh, don't know the people that are going to screw them. Uh, they don't know what is the maintenance, uh, all sorts of problems that you have no idea uh, about. I had to deal with this because uh, I had to deal with lawyers and uh, I didn't know uh, who were the right ones. And I had to go through, uh, I think it was six uh, firms in order to find the right one because the first two screwed me over, the, the other four were incompetent and all sorts of problems that occur. But if at the end of your life you just uh, put almost everything into Bitcoin, you know that there is no management. Everybody knows how to use that and they can transform it into anything, anywhere that the heirs want it to be. The thing that they are competent about the thing that they actually want to build and stuff like that because let's say that technically you give all uh, of the business to the right people you give all the property to the right people but because of the incompetency they're going to destroy it <laughs> or uh, stuff like that uh, so definitely uh, Another good point that Bitcoin, well, no management, no anything, and it's the easiest thing that uh, you could leave to your heirs, especially when they are kids. I was muted. Yeah, no, definitely. I, I completely agree. Um, so I, I think everyone's got to assess their own risk models. Some people want to have their hand held with a lawyer, with an accountant, with a company, with the government, whatever it may be. Obviously, like we said countless times, not financial advice, not legal advice. It's up for your own discretion and how you, your spouse, your family, your heirs want to plan this. Uh, ultimately, it comes down to you at the end of the day, how you want to do it. I know, like I said, many people just want to die with their Bitcoin and it's probably easier that way. You're, maybe your family fights yeah. over it from the grave, but um, that's a good way to do it. Uh, so uh, Ivan, you want to hit some of the news? I know things have been pretty crazy at least the last couple of weeks. I mean, it seems all of 2022 is crazy and 2023 is uh, ramping up to be the same way. So I know you're based out of Bulgaria, at least that's what you told me. Um, so obviously Nexo was this platform that was still operating post uh, or early into 2023. 
Um, they were offering 20% interest rates at their peak, even in uh, 2022. I, I think as of even December, they were giving 20%, at least double digit interest rates. And everyone's like, how are they doing this? It, Three Arrows Capital, had, uh, the hedge fund blew up because of fraudulent lending. Um, there was BlockFi, Voyager, Celsius, FTX all blew up. They were lending high single digit or double digit for stable coins and cryptocurrencies. Nexo was promoting 20% yield. And I'm like, okay, if they're giving you 20% yield, this is high, high risk, even higher than junk bonds and all those countries default on their amounts. So I was telling, or many Bitcoiners were flagging people, do not leave your money in Nexo after everything that's happened in 2022. <laughs> but then there are still people out here that are like, no, guys, they survived everything. Why? No, I'm just going to leave it there. They're still giving 20% interest. They didn't blow up like everyone else, so they must be doing the good thing. Well, it turns out you might have been wrong because a couple weeks ago, uh, Nexo was raided. Their headquarters is based out of Bulgaria or at least in Eastern Europe. Um, oh. and, and it seems that they were raided. Uh, many of their officers were apprehended or uh, lead officers of the company were apprehended and brought to jail. It seems that they're getting hit with wire fraud, money laundering, and basically a lot of the general charges that are brought up uh, uh, by against many exchanges that are fraudulent or go bust. Uh, so Ivan, since you are based out of there, what what's true? What's news? What's new noise? Like what, what are we being lied to here in the United States? Uh, uh, yeah, uh, obviously I don't know the exact uh, things, but I heard the rumor of a rumor that I'll uh, explain. Uh, but in general, anybody that says all oh, 20% uh, yield and stuff like that, like they're like at this point, it's in your face. <laughs> That's like the biggest red flag. Uh, they're scamming you. They uh, okay. If I call you and tell you, oh, it, it's like I am the wife of the uh, what was the guy on the TED talk, the funny comedian. Well, I'm the wife of um, uh, but, but not uh, Bill uh, Cosby. No. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, uh, who was the person that liberated uh, South Africa? Oh, uh, um, uh, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela. Yeah, uh, Nelson, Nelson Mandela. Mandela. And I I am going to leave you $2 million and stuff like that. Like when you see 20%, that's the exact type of uh, thing that you have to uh, trigger in your mind. Like, uh, But the rumor of a rumor from an unreliable uh, person, uh, I don't know how involved he is, but uh, the trigger... Uh, to raid the uh, office of Nexo was that they were using another way to pay their employees. So to avoid taxes this way. And because uh, they were paying it that way, uh, 180 something or whatever the amount of people that work there were uh, just, that was the reason to go do the rate. And obviously when you get into those companies, you find so much more than, but they just need one reason to go and do that. And be aware, because I don't know how the other things go, but there are four other companies in Bulgaria and uh, in Sofia, and two of them, uh, obviously not the headquarters, but one of them is Binance. The second one is crypto.com. So if you <laughs> hear some uh, news about that, uh, I don't know uh, if they're legit businesses. Uh, obviously, they will go. But uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, in my mind, if you're not a scammer and you are just an exchange, just like we have exchanges between euro, dollar, uh, uh, Russian ruble, uh, Chinese yen on the we, street. We have in exchanges for stocks and bonds. Like you can buy like yeah. a government bond or stocks and exchanges like that too. Yeah. Yeah. If you're legit, you have no problem. <laughs> but uh, once you have uh, your own uh, token uh, or whatever they call them, uh, like then like be aware. Uh, definitely, even if you're trying uh, to be legit if you don't have the capacity to understand that that's literally law and laundry of money and it's your own money try to print the money and see what happens <laughs> they are not going to wait but right now they are uh, it was just too confusing for the state how to go about this and now after ftx they have the excuse and okay we need to shut this down hard and i think if you they start uh 
penetrating not only the exchanges, but uh, the chains and all the other crypto bullshit, and they start dropping one by one, then uh, the legit ones will stay and they will be uh, tied to the NASDAQ and Bitcoin will rip like uh, even the institutions and uh, the companies that are going into for the next two years. Uh, that's my guess. But uh, on the front of uh, who is the next uh, exchange that's going to be rated, uh, I know that two of the offices uh, are here <laughs> uh, of these companies. So yeah, if it happens, uh, I don't know. And I, I think nobody actually knows what is the actual trigger uh, to go and raid that type of office. But when you have a reason, <laughs> it's just like, okay, I heard somebody like in, uh, like the police in the movies, I heard somebody screaming. They kick down the door and there's coke and there's a dead body <laughs> and all sorts of stuff <laughs> you find out. But uh, they're just trying to not give them a reason, I think. Uh, but they are coming. <laughs> So I, 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 I assume the police had probable cause or they must have had a smoking gun to exactly your point, kick down the door in order to raid the place. Obviously, yeah. if they did it without probable cause, the state could get in a bunch of trouble and Nexus could win a lawsuit against the state. So more often than not, the state operates too slow. That's not, neither a good thing nor a bad thing. It's just it is what it is. Uh, you know, lack of resources, not enough tax dollars, whatever it may be. But if they're kicking down someone's door, you most likely they have a, a good shot of getting you. Uh, I won't speak for Bulgaria, but I know that's what it is, at least in the United States. Um, yeah. I, I want to give a caveat to my listeners. So like to your point, like 20 percent interest is absurd. Think of it like this. When interest rates in the United States are pegged at like six percent, five percent right now, you know, we're, we're on its way up. We're at like four and a half, five percent. When you think of bonds, like so think of country bonds or corporate bonds, when you get into uh, high yield debt or like think of Argentina, perfect example. So if the U.S. is pegged at 6% or 5% returns, that's considered safe because the U.S. is less likely to default because we can print our own money. Small little caveat on this. So Argentina has to be higher than 5% or 6% in order to attract capital into that country. So I know what last time I looked, high yield debt was anywhere between nine to 11%, depending on the country. So when that's high yield debt, meaning that Argentina has collapsed four times, they're on their fifth collapse in just our lifetimes. So Ivan, I don't know how old you are, but I'm, you know, late twenties, early thirties. I'll just give everyone a caveat there. Uh, we've seen Argentina hyperinflate in the last 30 years and collapse four times. They're on their fifth brink right now. I've just had friends that were in Argentina and they said the price of they were only there for two weeks. And I think it went up 33 percent is how much the currency deflated. So when they're trying to give yields of anywhere from nine to 11 percent in Argentina and the country's collapsed at 11 percent, if you see an exchange giving 20 percent, you should run for the high heavens. That's like, you know, they're doubling the amount of high, high risk debt. In the last 30 years, we've seen these things collapse four times. So that that means that exchange rates should collapse exponentially faster than Argentina collapses on a 30 year time frame. And when you think of Bitcoin's only really been around since 2009, we're on year 14 already. Uh, and we've seen many businesses and companies collapse. I think that's probably a good probability or heuristic to go by. So uh, we don't need to touch on that anymore, but just be wary. Look at like where the yields are across all asset classes, and then just kind of caveat what the risk versus return that you're getting on this. I think the safest risk versus return is just holding your on Bitcoin, you get no yield, but it has had the best track record of any asset over the last 14 years. I know it's got its ups and downs, but over the course of the last 14 years, it's been the best performing asset by far. Um, so that's just my two sets. So next, moving on to talking about uh, getting rated or banks being uh, annoying or being weird. So it appears that Cash App, many people on Twitter were talking about over the last couple of days, that Cash App was flagging people's accounts, saying that there was fraud, saying that it wasn't allowed to work. It also seems that uh, Chase Bank, so obviously Jamie and Diamond of JP Morgan Chase, the CEO was on CNBC on their Mad Money or Fast Money, I forget what the name of the show is, and he was talking with a bunch of the analysts there saying, you know, Bitcoin's just a pet rock, but he loves blockchain. I think that's just his way of trying to be like, I love CBDCs, use JP Morgan coin use JP Morgan central bank digital currency. I, I, you know, we don't need to speculate there. Obviously he hates on Bitcoin because he can't print it, can't control it. And he thinks it's just what money launderers and pedophiles and you know, whatever insults he wants to spew. So it seems that Cash App is not allowing to people to buy Bitcoin and many people are having issues with their banks buying Bitcoin. This goes back to the, uh, the crux of the issue that we we're talking about in the very beginning. Obviously KYC exchanges, as much as we love Cash App, as much as Cash App is a Bitcoin only company. Yes, you can buy stocks and other things in there. 
there. It seems they're Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. At the end of the day, they are KYC exchange and you're not at the whims of the government or at the, the whims of other banks in order to be able to use it. Sorry for the long-winded response. Ivan, what are your thoughts on Cash App blocking users and or Chase Bank not allowing people to buy cryptocurrencies in general from some of these platforms? What are your thoughts? Uh, I think that uh, it, it's just entities. For me, the real life stuff in the world, uh, like atoms, things that make matter. And there are things that are uh, projections, imaginary, like the state and the company or everything else. And it's kind of a thought that I was having that all those entities, right now we live in a world where it's entity survival. And if one bigger entity is attacked or from a smaller entity, it's kind of a not a fair fight. And these days, these imaginary institutions and all sorts of things are sacrificing real life stuff and they're just disconnected from reality. And uh, Cash App not doing this, uh, my guess is that a bigger imaginary entity said, stop doing this. <laughs> so the company is under the state because the bigger, uh, the bigger imaginary institution and because the Cash App wants to survive, they will comply. Like uh, they kind of have no choice. I have no idea what's behind that, but that's the idea. If you base it on real stuff, uh, it's just kind of working. And then it's what can you actually accomplish? What do you want to do? Because if they block this way, life will find another way. <laughs> like it's just like a river going from the mountain that you want to block that uh, stream somewhere but if you block it it's just temporary the, it's going to build up and it's going to flow uh, another way and that's what they're creating uh, right now and at some point when uh, company uh, not companies but uh, entities like El Salvador start becoming the bigger <laughs> entity then they can dictate what's going to happen when Bitcoin starts overtaking all the small uh, entities like uh, Ethereum and, uh, and uh, smaller currencies that are going to collapse uh, through inflation and all those kinds of things, then naturally that type of entity will die. And uh, the good thing is that uh, other than fiat, uh, Bitcoin would be the only thing that is destroying the uselessness, is destroying the the things that are parasites, destroying the greed, destroying all sorts of things, and it's for the good of humanity. And uh, what uh, Jamie Dimon said, I don't know uh, how much they actually studied Bitcoin, uh, because through my own experience that I was absolutely certain because of me working into the scam companies that this is the same because they used crypto and bitcoin and all sorts of things to scam people it was very much ingrained in me that this is absolute scam and imagine that and i was working for three months <laughs> in this type of industry imagine working in that industry for 30 years and now all your beliefs are, are going to collapse. And you have to have the humility to say, I need to relearn that. And your whole identity changes, just like we experience uh, going into the rabbit hole. But it's like, uh, uh, I don't want to provoke too much people, but let's say you were a Christian for 50 years, and now you want to be another religion. And uh, it's the same in the fiat system. Like your so much belief system around it is involved in that's the way the life works. I have no idea what kind of a brain uh, in his uh, brain has to happen to start studying actually. So even if you start study, you come with a bias. Uh, like this is not true. When you get to the point of curiosity, it's really hard because when we are young, it's really easy to learn stuff. The hard thing is to forget stuff that you know so you could replace it 
with the new stuff. So that's kind of my thoughts around those issues. I think that's great. I think that was a great explanation. And I kind of heard two caveats. So one, it was one user having, or one user that I know that was having issues buying it and Cash App was saying it was different from his normal purchases. He's like, I normally buy a few hundred bucks here and there, but he, they were like, oh, but we claim that you, we see that you're in a different country. He's like, I told you I was traveling internationally or why do I even have to say I'm traveling internationally? It's my money. I do whatever I want. But apparently it seemed like he was getting dinged based on the IP address where he was logging in to buy it. That's one. And then Chase Bank claimed that they, it was, they were just not allowing people to buy cryptocurrencies at general. It seems that people are having issues because they were using credit cards and debit cards. And some exchanges will actually float up to a few thousand dollars, meaning that let's just say I bought a thousand dollars worth of Bitcoin and then I withdrew it. The exchange will send it to me before the money goes through. Then people were calling their credit card companies and being like, oh, my my account got hacked. You know, someone used it to buy Bitcoin, not knowing that like, I mean, this is fraud. So this is literally do not do this. <laughs> this is legal. I'm not a lawyer, but this is legal advice. This is fraud against the company. If you get caught, this is serious jail time but people were basically committing fraud in the sense of like oh someone stole my credit card and did this but it was really them that was purchasing it and then sending it as soon as you know it hits one confirmation it's very very hard like you know to roll near impossible to roll back one transaction in order for uh for bitcoin at least so um yeah so they were calling before the money even gets to the exchange and then they were able to withdraw it so basically the exchange was crediting at you knowing that the money was coming there but since the antiquated system takes t2 clearing time it takes that amount of time for the money to get there moving on i don't know people are doing that that's kind of clever but uh when you actually do that be aware because it stays forever it's not like it's hidden they can go after you in 50 years about that. Not in yeah. 50, there's yeah. statute of limitations, but uh, when they tr- crack down on a regulation and all sorts of ways to get after your Bitcoin, they will do their best and they will get it if you've done stuff like that. You're a very easy target. Yeah, exactly. It lives on the blockchain forever. And then it's even worse because you're tied to it. It's your credit card. You claim that you're stolen. But if it's you, they'll eventually tie it back to you one way or the other. So uh, I would not advocate for that for that. It's like trying to go rob a bank in broad daylight without a mask on. Like, yeah, you may get 500 bucks, <laughs> yeah. you may get a thousand bucks. But at the end of the day, like they're, they're going to find you. Um, so wouldn't advocate for that. Last and final story. Uh, Binance was apparently removed from the SWIFT system. So now it seems that it was not Binance USA. It was Binance abroad. And it only seems to be selected countries. Uh, it actually seemed to be based out of Eastern Europe. So have you heard more about this, Ivan? I know that you're saying Binance and Crypto.com actually have headquarters in Bulgaria. I'm not sure if it was Bulgaria in general. It wasn't like they were removed like Russia from the SWIFT system. It was just like it seemed to be a certain country or certain banks and exchanges that were removed from it. it see, I, I don't want to caveat and say that like, oh, this is another sanctioning of Russian citizens, but it seems to be kind of in that same vein. It doesn't seem like a full removal of uh, from the SWIFT system, but people were getting emails saying uh, in in Europe, at least, that they were not able to buy uh, Bitcoin with USD or, or buy cryptocurrencies with USD over in Europe. I don't know if you heard more about this story. It kind of broke uh, either yesterday uh, or early this morning. Yeah, actually, I have not yet heard about this. I have not been on Twitter in the last, uh, I don't know, 24 hours. <laughs> Probably better. Uh, I was kind of uh, lazy <laughs> on that front. But uh, again, the point is that uh, it doesn't matter if it's a uh, headquartered in Bulgaria or anywhere else in the world. Uh, Right now, this is a global issue for central banks and they can't uh, tie their own uh, shoes. (laughs) At this point, they're creating so many problems and they're going to go after what they actually do. Uh, They're right now, because this is the digital gold, we know what they did with the analog gold. Uh, So they're going to go after uh, that front and again the people that are doing shady shit are going to go uh, first and uh, if you're tied in that front uh, sorry the people that are going uh, through there and doing legit stuff there's going to be collateral damage (laughs) so that's not good either but I expect them to do exactly what they've done like uh, people hardly ever change and institutions are a bunch of people so they'll do the same they will say oh we are confiscating your bitcoin everybody that is not uh, self-custodying uh then they're going to be 
oh, we are going to actually take the Bitcoin that somebody has some of the asset management are doing. I do expect in the long run uh, to go after. So I'm not exactly certain how certain is seller to keep that amount of uh, Bitcoin not in their custody. But uh, it's again, the game theory at some point, let's say in 50, 60, 70 years or even a hundred, I expect all the people to be their own bank and the banks would be so, so much less. Uh, it will be just so much localized in a sense, but uh, in, a, in a global connectedness everywhere. But uh, yeah, I would say that is it. They're just having an excuse to go after Binance or anybody else because those, and they should, by the way, if you're not doing, I wouldn't say even about the legality. It's about kind of a moral and uh, a code that is just about the nature. And nature is not really just, but uh, if somebody screws over somebody else, uh, people are vengeful and <laughs> the states have the most power, so they're coming. So those would be the first one to go. <laughs> Yeah, no, I think that's great. Uh, so that's all the stories I got today. And we've actually almost been in that, about an hour. So Ivan, thank you so much for coming on. Anything that you want to plug or shill, whether it's your Twitter or your business or anything you want to do, I'll give this time for you to, to mention anything else that you want. Uh, yeah, uh, I would say if anybody is interested to following me, uh, I do some cool animations. I don't know if they're cool, but <laughs> I'm not the one to judge. On Twitter, uh, my uh, handle is Naku2000, N-A-C-K-O-O, -O, 2000. Uh, and because of those, I kind of use the opportunity to, to connect to other Bitcoiners and uh, they reach out to me, the people that like them. So that's fun. And uh, I would like to do a humble brag that uh, in a month or so, Thanks to me being into the Bulgarian conference about Bitcoin, uh, I connected to a few people that came here and they were gracious enough. And I'm very humbled to say that I'll be joining the Breeze team uh, on March. And that would be awesome. I can't wait. <laughs> well, I'm talking to Roy uh, over Telegram and uh, things like that, so going through their articles. The things that they are building, uh, I simply can't wait. And I'm telling him, give me some stuff to do because I just want to orange people, as many people as I can. And uh, that's the way that I view it. Uh, right now, all the Bitcoiners should orange people because the house is on fire and our kids are in it. Yeah. <laughs> so that's the image that I have in my mind and whether they realize it or not, it doesn't matter. You have to get them to safety. So, yeah, no, that's great. Congrats on joining the breeze team. I know Roy is doing a lot of awesome things with the breeze app and his team. I actually almost forgot. I have two last questions. So there's questions I ask every guest. So you did the show first, but I got to ask you these questions. Uh, what has been your biggest investing mistake over the course of your career? It can be, you know, anything it can be a personal investing mistake. It could be, you know, you putting money in something like a scam. What's been your biggest, uh, investing mistake? Uh, I would say, uh, it's not really, uh, the direct investment, but I would say that, uh, there are two regrets in my life. It's the road that I knew that I had to take, but didn't. The first one was I wanted to quit university <laughs> at uh, my first year. And because of my parents, they convinced me not to do it. But it was just so horrible <laughs> that I stayed for three more years and I still quit. <laughs> and I don't have a degree from university. No way. That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, but maybe yeah, you should have so... quit earlier. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I didn't take my exams and stuff like that. And it was just, uh, I wanted to study and uh, entrepreneurship and the stuff that were uh, teaching me there, I knew from 10 years ago, like because I was gracious enough that I was working for my uh, parents uh, about that. But I would say the three year investment <laughs> in university, definitely not. Uh, and I'm talking about myself. 
So that is it. And there was another case where I should have made a partnership with somebody, but again, somebody else convinced me not to do it. And after two years this time, I made a uh, partnership uh, with him. He was gracious enough to start it. So I would say those five years about those two decisions were the biggest uh, investment mistake because when I make the mistake, it's fine. But the biggest mistake is not listening to myself and somebody else convinced me uh, to do what they think is right. Yeah. And Bitcoin really teaches you to think independently. <laughs> Just yeah. yeah, you can't get back lost time, which is very unfortunate. All right, last question, and then we'll wrap it up very quickly. Uh, what is your favorite... Uh, podcast, book, YouTube video, whatever. What's your go-to orange pill moment for you or that you like to give to people? Um, you don't have to list all of them, but what's your favorite one piece of content that you like to watch about Bitcoin or for helping you or someone else? Uh, I'm Depending on uh, whoever is, uh, he is on his journey about Bitcoin, but I definitely say that the three uh biggest themes are uh, first from michael seller is just the general view connecting the reality to the monetary system because the engineering point of view the second one is about technology jeff booth uh and price uh, of tomorrow his, uh, yeah yeah price of tomorrow and just his point of view and the third one uh the biggest theme is jason lowry uh, I'm not exactly certain about his uh, claim that Bitcoin is a weapon because that's the first weapon that, uh, in my view, is only defensive. Uh, it's not uh, somebody that you can assault uh, with. But just his, again, uh, from the uh, power projection type of thinking, those are three huge teams that are in Bitcoin. And I bet that other teams uh will occur but anybody that doesn't know about bitcoin i refer to those three guys to start with and then the technical details and definitely right now i'm studying more and more about lightning because that will make bitcoin uh medium of exchange so yeah. that is it Ivan, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, for listening. This was a great conversation. I hope you enjoyed it. I know I did. Uh, Ivan, it's been a pleasure having you on. We'll definitely have to talk sometime soon. Uh, so thanks, everyone. I'll catch you next week on next week's episode. Have a good one. Peace out, everyone. Peace.